Well, good morning. My name is Angela Bradley. I am uh, one of the pastors on staff here. And it is my privilege to share with you, we have been in a series on 1 Thessalonians. And 1 Thessalonians is the very first book written by Apostle Paul. And in it, he shares some of the very first ideas about things like the church and about the Holy Spirit. And so our job in this series is to really dig deep into this book and understand what it was that the Thessalonians were doing right. Because as Paul wrote lots of different letters to different churches, the Thessalonians were the only ones that he ever said got it right. There's something valuable in that. We want to be able to pattern our lives and use the time that we have here on earth for good. We want to be able to, to major on the majors and, 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 and do the right things, aim our life in the right direction. And so we are going to delve into this again today to learn a little bit more about, uh, about Paul and the Thessalonians. You know, the, the, the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, Paul was really looking at them and commending them and saying, hey, you guys have done a great job. And then in chapter 2, he takes a moment and he's talking about himself. And he's talking about some of the things that he went through to even help to get the Thessalonians to where they were. It's kind of like, uh, does, has anybody been following the NCAA uh, ch championship, the tournament, the college basketball tournament. Has anybody been following that? Oh, raise your hands. You can be, be honest. March Madness. Okay. Well, those of you who watch that or, or almost any sport, you notice at the end, the coach who won, they interview him or her. And when they interview them, they're always saying, well, man, I'm so glad we were able to win. And, you know, this was a really hard-fought battle that, that, those, that our opponents were really tough. And that's kind of what 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is. It's, it's, it's where he's said, yeah, I'm so glad that we won. But then he's getting into some of the choices and the decisions that it took for him to even be able to get to that place. And so for those of you, if this is your first time uh, with us in this series, I want to tell you a little bit about Paul. His name was not always Paul. His name used to be Saul. And it's so funny, my daughter was, we were studying King Saul in the Bible uh, a couple of months ago, and she was writing about him. She's seven. She's like, and King Saul, he did pretty good, but then all of a sudden he started persecuting the Christians. I was like, no, no, not the same Saul. <laughs> not the same Saul. But when he was Saul, he was what he called, he called himself in Acts chapter 22. He says, I have many reasons to boast. He was kind of arrogant in his former life. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am a Pharisee. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. If anybody has any reason to boast, it's me. He had studied with the best of the best at the best school at the time, with the best instructor that they had at that time. And so he knew the word of God, right? He had studied whole books of the Bible. He could debate with the best of them. And he had followed all of the laws. And he was confident that he had followed the laws and he, had, he was a righteous man because he had done what was right. And he hated those who did not follow what he thought was right. He hated Christians. And so what he did was he made sure that he was killing those who he felt like were blaspheming. He said, I know the word of God. These people are blaspheming in the word of God. I'm going to kill them. And so we're going to take a look at who he was, this Saul. And then in chapter 2, we're going to look at when his name was changed. What did that look like? What did he look like as a changed man after he had encountered God? So you can follow along with me in the Bible right in front of you, in, on page chapter 808 in front of you, or you can look on your device. You can go to our app, 
to follow along. I love that when somebody is speaking about the Bible, I love to follow along. A, so I can see, are you telling the truth? And B, I love to be able to glean from the word myself. So I encourage you to do that this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, you know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not in vain. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. He had been imprisoned there, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dare tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else. Even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. May God bless the reading of his word. So do you see how changed this man was? He went from this arrogant man who knew where he came from and what he was all about and what he demanded to this man who was willing to give everything. He was willing to be beaten and imprisoned and then he would come back for more to continue to preach the gospel that they might know him. What was his motivation? I mean, you know, back then, they had something called the Levites, and so the people who served God, it was their right to have the people to pay for them and to make sure that they had a living. If they were going to serve God, then please take care of them by all means, all of their needs. But he said, you know what? You don't even have to do that for me. I'll work another job. I'll work day and night just so I can get this word to you. This was a humble man. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I pattern myself after that, right? I, I, I was studying this chapter. I don't know how many times I read it over and over and over again, trying to glean little things like, how can I pattern myself after that? And I'm thinking, you know, you got one time, one good time, maybe two good times to hit me, and I'm going to get you back. How did he not do that? Once he was treated shamefully, he went back in there. What was his motivation? What was that engine that kept him going? And I had to look back at that moment when he changed from Saul to Paul. He had this experience, and you may have heard of it, called the road to Damascus. And on that road to Damascus, he had received papers from all of the, the holy men of that day to say, you know what? Yes, you have our permission to go and kill these people in Damascus, these Christians who you hate so much. And so he was on his way. He had his papers. He was on his way to go handle these people and take them out because they were blaspheming his God. And on his way there, all of a sudden, he saw a light that blinded him. 
that light was Jesus himself. And Jesus blinded his natural eyes and opened up his spiritual eyes to be able to see him for who he really is in all of his beauty, in all of his splendor, and all of his gloriousness. And I realized that I don't have to try to pattern myself after Paul, that I can have that same road to Damascus experience. There are times for all of us where we really need to take our eyes off of what's going on in the natural around us, where we have to put our eyes onto Jesus. And can I tell you that that's the only place where real change happens. Change does not happen from your grit or your determination or you're making another New Year's resolution. Change comes as you behold who Jesus is. It's just that simple. And it's so simple that sometimes we miss it. But he is so big and so powerful that if we just look at him, we can be changed into who he is. We can be changed into his image. Later on in his life, Paul would reflect on this change that he had. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, he says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from not grit, which comes from not determination, but which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You know, I have, um, I've been studying this chapter so much over the last couple of weeks, over and over again, didn't get much sleep. You know why? It's because Pastor Ricky preached so good those first three messages. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to follow that, right? So I was studying. I was studying, and I got into the Word so deep that something happened, there is this place in me, a source place in me, that if it gets triggered, I'm going to have a certain reaction. And every time, it doesn't matter what I do, I've read books about it, I've prayed about it, I've fasted on it, but every time I get triggered in this source place in my heart, I go off the handle and I cannot control myself. And I don't like that. But it's what happens. I'm just being honest. And so it happened to me again. It got pushed. My button got pushed. And then all of a sudden, out of my mouth, I said, oh, that's okay. And I'm like, who who said that? Because that didn't come from me, and I didn't feel crazy in my head, right? And then it happened again, and I'm like... This is Jesus <laughs> because I, can't, I cannot force myself to change as much as I've wanted to change. And that change in me came from all of that extra time that I had spent in his presence. And all of that extra time I had spent in his word. That's where the change comes from. And we all have places like that places where we get triggered by something, things that we want to change in our life. That's why we make New Year's resolutions. That's why we make, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to get accountability partners, and I'm not going to do this again. But let's follow the model of the Word. Just try it. Look at Jesus. Open up His Word and see Him. Look at his thoughts. Look at his responses to things. Find out what was important to him. Find out what pulled his attention. Find out the things that got him upset. Learn about his character. Learn about his heart. And the more you look at him in his word, the more you can become like him. So the more I studied this chapter, I noticed that Paul started to look familiar. I read it over and over again. He was willing to give up himself, his position of authority, because truly he was in a position of authority. He gave that up 
and was willing to give anything for the gospel to get to the people who was around him, for him to be able to change the world with that word. And I'm like, you sound familiar. He sounded like Jesus. He spent time looking at Jesus and began to act like him. And it was just a byproduct of it. Just looking at Jesus, he became like Jesus. And in chapter 1, he's saying to the Thessalonians, you know what? I became like Jesus, and you watched me, and you became like me. And not only did the Thessalonians become like Paul, but he says in chapter 1, that all of the other Christians who were watching the Thessalonians became like the Thessalonians. So what that is called is the compounding effect, right? We want that to happen with our finances. Amen, glory to God. (laughs) But that compounding effect, you can see how the gospel can be spread all over the world, right? As we behold him, we become like him. As people watch us, they become like him too. Amen? So now, thousands of years later, and it's our turn. The baton has been passed to us. We are now this new thread that God is weaving in his tapestry. He has a picture that he is trying to create in the world and every single one of you here and all those joining us online, everyone plays a part in that tapestry. What do we do with it? How can we contribute to this thing, this beautiful thing that God is wanting to create in the world? I think I found part of the answer as I was studying and it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And it breaks down a few steps that we can follow. And I love the English Standard Version of this verse. And it says, but just as we have been approved, and in the Greek, that means deemed worthy. We've been deemed worthy by God. Not of our own doing, just because he's so good. We've been deemed worthy by God to be entrusted with the gospel. So we speak. Not to please man, but to please God, who tests, and that also means deemed worthy, our hearts. I'm going to read it again. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. I don't know about you, but... Have you ever had something so good that to eat that you kind of hide it from other people? (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, I'm not alone. (laughs) For some reason, every time I get up here, I'm talking about food. So you see, you see what I'm all about, Jesus and food. (laughs) But I used to hear, before I had kids, I heard women talking, mothers particularly, talking about how they had little stashes of snacks, how they would go in the bathroom and like eat their snack. And I'm thinking, that's so pitiful. (laughs) That's just pitiful. Like, what's wrong with her? And now that I've had kids, I realize it's brilliant and necessary. (laughs) And so I was in in the car with my husband. We were on a date uh, this weekend, and I was like, oh, I want some chocolate. And uh, uh, I had a little hiding place in the armrest under the stuff, right? And there was my chocolate. I got hiding places back in the refrigerator, back where our little kids can't reach. I've got hiding places for my Lily's Stevia sweet and chocolate in our bedroom and all kind of places underneath stuff, right? I got all kind of places because it's so good. My chocolate is so good. (laughs) And I want nobody else to have it. 
But then there are some things that are so good, like we were, we were on another date, and uh, I guess we date a lot, huh? We were on another date, and we were at our favorite restaurant, which is Epiphany in Bloomington, if you guys ever want to go and get something delicious. And so the first time I had their lamb shank, it was like mind-bendingly good. Like I couldn't even get like words out the first time I had it, right? And I'm like eating this, and then all of a sudden I like shove it in his mouth, and I'm like, this is so good, you gotta try it, right? Because I had been transported to heaven and I came back down, I was like, I gotta share this with this man. (laughs) And that's a really rudimentary example But I believe after studying this that the gospel is so good that you just can't keep it to yourself. We have been entrusted with the gospel. It's not something only that we can possess, but the gospel, this good news, is something that we have to give away. And the good news that I don't have to go searching for God, but that there is a God searching for me and actually came down to earth to live like me and understand what I'm going through and have mercy on me. That's good news. It's good news that I don't have to obey the 613 laws in Judaism to be pleasing to God, but that I'm pleasing to him just by believing in him. That's good news to me. It's good news. It's so good, I got to tell somebody. Other people have to know that there is an answer to life's longings. Other people have to know, like I know, that they don't have to stay up wandering and wondering, but that there is a God who never sleeps and who never slumbers that they can count on. Other people have to know that they are not an accident, but that there's a God who has a purpose for their life. And if they just look to him, they can truly live their best life. It's so good that I have to share it with somebody. Somebody else has to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's a privilege to know him, but it is a responsibility for all of us who call Christ our Lord to share him. I'm not the only minister of the gospel in this room. Everyone who calls himself a follower of Christ are ministers and ambassadors of Christ to this world. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. That's the good news in its various forms. Let's look back at verse 4. It says, but just as we have been approved, we've been deemed worthy by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. And those three little words are so powerful because those three little words mean that, yes, it's not just that I've acknowledged that this is what I should do. I'm about to go do it. So I speak. So I take steps out there to go follow the will of God and to put it in action. It's not something that I just hear on a Sunday morning. This is something that I do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'm going to show that love of God to the world. My husband didn't know I was going to tell the story, but while I was out getting our three children's shoes, you ain't never going to sit on the front row again, are you? <laughs> As I was out getting our children, our three children's shoes, because they had grown out of the shoes that I had just purchased for them the month before, <laughs> he said that he was not going to go with me, but that he was going to stay home and he was going to clean the house. And so I left and I came back. And the living room was clean. And the family room was clean. And the man was at the sink in the kitchen washing the dishes. That was a good steward. He got it done. He handled it. I mean, it was done. It was beautiful. He did a great job. 
He didn't just talk about it. He made it happen. And I wonder about us. When God returns and he looks at us, what will we have done with what he gave us? We, we have gotten it done what he said, you, you are my good and faithful servant. Or will he say, you talked about it, but you didn't get it done. We want when he comes back for us to say, oh, you got it done. You handled it. You showed my love to this world. There's receiving God's love but then you have to actually go out and intentionally show that love to others. Verse four goes on to say, I do all of this not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Paul went out of his way to be able to boast that what he was doing was for God. And it was not about making money. It was not about receiving praise from people, but it was to please God. And you can't just leave here this morning and say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do something good. Check. I did it, God. It's done. You have to do it in love. And Paul, I love that this is his first letter that we're studying because then I can go through other letters and really uh, see what he learned from his experiences. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says, and this is a smart man, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. I volunteered here at the church for the first 10 years uh, in our food pantry, building that ministry up. And uh, I served eight families the first month and built it up over time to we were serving 25,000 people in a year. And a shameless plug, we are coming back. The pantry will be starting here at this church April 12th, and we need volunteers. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But I volunteered in that ministry, and there were days, uh, you know, some of my slow weeks, some of my regular weeks were working 60 hours a week, volunteering that long. And I can tell you that sometimes when you volunteer out of a desire to just do something good, you can burn out. So something that I had to learn through hardship, something that I had to learn over time, and I'll share it with you. This is a secret. And we'll find out that Paul learned the secret as well. Is that you cannot just serve out of a good heart. The key to longevity, to really being able to serve well, to really being able to love well in your family, in your home, on your job, with your church family, with everyone that you encounter, the key is that love that Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But I believe that that love is not something that you just drum up, okay, I'm going to love you. It's not something that you drum up. That love is a love between you and God. So here's what I had to do at those long days. I had to say, you know what? It's the end of the day. I've been up for hours. I'm on my feet. My feet were hurting. And three people come in the door, and we got, we're supposed to be open like in five or close in five minutes, right? Three families walk in the door, and I'm tired. And so what I learned to do was to close my eyes to them, blind my eyes to the natural, and open up my eyes to the spiritual. And I would say, oh, Jesus, I'm so glad that you came. Thank you for coming today. Would you like another loaf of bread? Oh, you said you, rye is your favorite type of bread? Oh, I've got two more. Here, Jesus. 
Oh, 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 you, 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 say, you say your children love Apple Jacks? Oh, take some more. Take some more for them. Jesus. And everything that I did, I did as unto him. And then it became this love relationship that I was receiving the love that he had for me and I was giving love back to him. I was showing love to other people in his name. In Matthew 25, he says, if you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. And if you serve him in whatever you do, get your eyes off of the people who get on your nerves. And focus in on him. Give as unto him. Serve as unto him. And at the end of the day, when you are exhausted and your children you're trying to put them to bed, and they're acting like whack-a-mole. As soon as you get one down, another one pops back up, asking for water or asking for the meaning of the universe. And why did Jesus have to die? And mommy, can't you tell me the answer about the resurrection? And you're exhausted. You have nothing left. You serve your family as unto Jesus. That's the love relationship, not as unto men, but as unto God. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And those human masters can trip us up. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Everything you do as you serve others and you're doing it as to him, he will reward you. You can't look to other people to give that to you. People are people. They're fallible. They make mistakes. They're not perfect. People will disappoint you, but God will not. He is perfect, and he is good. So in closing, I hope you remember four things this morning. One, learn more about the person of Jesus. Look at him. Those changes that you want in your life, those places where you cannot get yourself unstuck. You can't get out of it. You can't stop doing it. Don't try to get grit and bear it. When it's going on, put your eyes on Jesus. Focus in on him and his word. Look for all the scriptures that's talking about him. Look at his character, his thoughts, and his ways. The more you look at him, the more you will be changed into his image. Sheer will to change really doesn't work for very long. Number two, recognize that you have been entrusted with some really good news that just has to be shared. And then number three, just do it. Find ways to share his love with others. And finally, whatever you do, do it for an audience of one. Do it as if you were literally doing it to him and it will turn into an act of worship, whatever it is, and an act of love between you and your maker. Amen. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to transition into our time of generosity, and Pastor Ryan will come up in just a few moments. But I just wanted to pray with us this morning. Father God, I thank you so much for our own mini road to Damascus experience this morning. Our own mini time where we are focusing in on you. And we're taking our eyes off of everything else around us. That's the only place that real change comes from. That's the only place that 
peace is truly found when we have our minds stayed on you. And so, Lord, I ask you that you remind us when we leave out of these doors and the world starts to swirl and pull and tug at us, remind us to stop and to focus in on you. Remind us, Lord, to look to you, to receive your love, to give your love, and to love others as if we were loving you in the name of Jesus, God. Lord, we pray that when people see us, that they see you and that they are attracted to you and that many people will come to know you just through our example. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen.